All right, welcome to the Bible study. And before we start on our lesson, Understanding Salvation, uh, we usually, all I usually do is uh, pray, invite the real teacher. We're going to invite the presence of the Holy Spirit, that He would inspire our hearts, reveal the mysteries of the Gospel to us through the Word of God, because we need Him. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot understand um, the truth that is in the Bible. So, I will do a prayer and then we will start. Father, in the name of Jesus, send to us your Holy Spirit, God. He is a gentle teacher that will teach us all things, that will guide us in all truth. Holy Spirit, we completely lean on you. We rely on you, God. We cannot do anything without you. So I ask you, Holy Spirit, you are the teacher that you would teach us from the Word of God, that you would teach us, the Lord, and open to us, reveal to us the mysteries of Christ, to our human spirit, Lord. Reveal yourself to us. So we thank you, Lord. Let the name of Jesus be glorified in this place. Amen and amen. All right. So understanding salvation is going to be a lesson. And in this lesson that we will cover is, uh, first, what is salvation? What are we saved from? And then we'll talk about what is death, the meaning of death. And then we'll talk about how are we saved from death. And then difference between old and new covenants. And can we lose our salvation? I mean, those are questions people have and I'm going to try to answer those in the light of, of, the, of the gospel. Well, salvation is redemption from spiritual and physical separation from God. Redemption meaning that once we got separated from God through the sin, the original sin, you have to go all the way back to Genesis 1, where when Adam disobeyed God, it was the first open rebellion on earth that Adam actually um, partook with his wife. He wasn't alone in this. And when that happened, Holy Spirit that dwelled inside Adam, he, he left. He left. And so there was a separation between Adam's spirit and the spirit of God. So Adam still lived, even though God says, if you eat from the, from the tree of knowledge, you surely will die. And, but he obviously didn't die, he, he lived. But what happened is, as we'll talk about what that really means, is he was separated from the presence of God on the inside, in the inner man. And so redemption is the reconnection, or salvation, is the recon re reconnection of our human spirit to the Spirit of God. So, which means we, uh, in that context, uh, that somebody had to die for his rebellion. Well, there was no people on earth besides the two that sinned, so there was, nobody could take their place. So this is why, you know, Jesus came and we understand the gospel. He came to as a second Adam. Bible calls him the second Adam. He came as a man. He put on flesh so that he could take the, our place in a sense and that the original sin would be forgiven of rebellion and our spirit would be called born again. It was dead when we came into the body and through the blood of Jesus Christ it can be born one more time once again or reconnected back to God. Well, let's look at the Ephesians uh, 2, 4. This is the scripture. Paul writes, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loves us, loved us. Again, this is setting up the context. Why? Why does God want it to reconnect to people? Well, it's because of love. Why does He love us? Why does He love us so much? Like you look at your life, you're like, well, there's not really much to love. Like why would God pursue people so much? Well, to understand that, we have to understand where, you're, where, you're, where you came from, where I came from, our human spirit. Because our human spirit came out of God. We are His offspring. We are the children of God. Our spirit came out of God. And so when He breathed you and me into a physical body, and that's when our soul gets activated and our awareness, we, start, we, become, we become aware when our spirit enters the physical body, so we become aware. So when that happens, we became a living 
being. So because we came from God, we are children of God. And Jesus, He's the firstborn. So in the book of Hebrews, if you read the passage, in you know, Hebrews chapter 2, it talks about that He um, actually uh, is our brother. He calls us brothers, brethren. Why? Because we come from one source, God. So we are the children of God. Angels or the spirits or the servant spirits are created. In Hebrews chapter 1 it says that the, 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 the servant spirits are created by angels. We were born. We came out of God. So when our spirit came to this planet, God placed us in this, uh, I would call it, an environment where we receive our awareness, where our soul has to be, um, has, to, has to develop if you want to use that term, where we grow in the things of love, family, all those dynamics. We, you know, this is, this is the only time we get to do this. The physical life is the only time. But so when people die, literally they're going back home. Because we come from heaven, we're going to go back. Those who are in the Lord are going back home. Literally, that's what really, because we come from Him, we're going back to Him. So salvation is, is what God does to our human spirit. Again, reconnection. Alright, then uh, verse down. Even when we were dead in trespasses. So what does it mean to be dead? Again, we're going to cover what it means to be dead. So God loved us, but we were dead or separated from His Spirit. Well, He made us alive. He says He made us alive together with Christ. He made us alive. Alive, what part of our being did He make alive? Our human spirit. He made alive our human spirit through the cross, meaning connecting my human spirit, where your soul lives, to God's Holy Spirit. He's joined us together to Himself through Christ. So, we became adopted back to where we came from. Uh, Luke chapter 15, and that's a really good illustration of a prodigal son. It, it has more implications, but like we kind of read that and we think, well, somebody you know, leaves our family, kind of the father's house. It's, it's, it has more implications. It's, a, it's on a global level where Jesus explains where we come from God, but because we, our spirit enters the body and the, 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 the law of death lives in our members, we get separated. So, we come from God, we enter the body. Now, we didn't decide when we're going to come, at what uh, timeline. God decided that. And so, He breathed us in, into the womb, into the little cell. But because the, the, the gene or the DNA, the atom, or the, or the spiritual, the sinful nature, it, it, it goes from the DNA. It's, it goes all the way from Adam. Because it lived in that on that cellular level and the DNA, when we enter the body, because there's a sinful nature, we get separated. We need to get reconnected again. So every single person that is born needs to be saved. Everyone. So some says, well, I was born, I was, kinda, I, was, I was a really good kid. It doesn't work that way. You are separated at birth. You need Jesus to reconnect back to God. We all need salvation because all have sinned. I mean, it's Bible's pretty clear. Romans 3.23, it says very clear, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Well, when you look at, uh, you know, at, at, at a baby, like you think, like, like and it's interesting if you have kids. Did you, did you notice that when, they, when they're, um, you know, they're born, I mean, they are very small, don't understand nothing, but you start seeing bad traits. Like, you have to teach them good things. You don't have to teach them bad things. Did you notice that? How natural bad things come. You know, the whole taking advantage of, you know, crying, and then just, just all, like, yeah, manipulate, very, very manipulate. Where is this coming from? It just came out. It's like, where, like, like how? Well, it's that spiritual law of death, their human spirit being separated from God. So all they have is their soul, is all their senses. So, so their perception of everything, their awareness, their perception is from the five senses. 
All right, so that's why you need to teach people good things. It's not natural for them. Now, when we get born again, things change a little bit. But in the very, we're talking about the original sin and that we all need salvation. In that sense, uh, we are born and we get separated from God pretty much when we enter the human body or the embryo. All right, original sin of rebellion passed down from Adam and is in our DNA. It says, Romans 7.23, the law of sin which is in my members. So where is the spiritual law of sin live? In our physical body. This is why this body can't live forever anymore. It has to go through the process of aging and, you know, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to keep it up. And why? Because that spiritual law is, of sin is destroying our body. We can no longer live forever because of that. So what is death? Let's cover a little bit what is death. Well, our spirit is eternal. You know, you don't disappear. I mean, it, when, you, when your body dies, uh, you don't stop existing. Our spirits are eternal. So what, when the Bible, say, when the Bible, Bible says that, uh, you know, or talks about death, like what does it mean? Well, spiritual death, what means? It's separation of our human spirit with God's spirit. That's called spiritual death. Physical death is separation of our spirit with our physical body. Alright? So, when we separate from our physical body, we just step over into the spiritual realm. Simple as that. We don't disappear. We don't fall asleep and then kind of wake up later, like, you know, at the judgment day. You do not stop existing. So, death, if, you, if it's spiritual death, it means you're separated from God, your spirit separated from God's spirit. Physical death means your spirit separated from your physical body. So you could be spiritually dead, but physically alive. Yeah, it happens. I mean, a lot of people live like that. You know, they, their, their perception or how they um, perceive things is through their five senses, through their soulish realm. That, that's all, they, that's all they, they have. You know, their emotions, like all, whatever makes up a soul, it's all they have. Uh, because um, they're spiritual dead, they're not connected to God. So, how are we saved from death? Well, the salvation message actually was preached. The first time God um, talked about salvation, it's actually in, in Genesis. It's all the way, right after the fall. He prophesied to the woman, and He said that from her seed, I think it's Genesis 3, from her seed, God was going to raise up the Messiah. And He was going to bruise the devil, or He was going to defeat the devil. And at that point on, anybody who believed in the, you know, before Christ came, anybody who believed the promise of the seed, were saved. We were saved by faith in the first covenant or before the first covenant, before, before Moses was even on the scene. Abraham was justified by faith because he believed in the seed that God promised him a seed. He promised him Messiah. So people before even the law, and, and you know, if you look at genealogy of Jesus, you can, they're there in the book of Matthew, you can kind of see, you know, uh, that's, the, that's, that's how the seed of faith was, was established. And so, so the seed was, um, you know, to, or the Christ would come through, through, through that. And people that believed that, they were saved. In fact, uh, um, in, in Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. Paul uses that scripture out of Habakkuk. 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 It's easier in Russian, for sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's chapter uh, 2, verse 4, it's, a, it's actually uh, an Old Testament prophet. God speaks through the Old Testament prophet that the just shall live by faith. I mean, that's, can you imagine, people have the law, I mean, they're trying to do things, but at the core, with all of those mosaic things, that sacrifices, all the religious observances that, you know, that they had to observe, that was just set for a, for a season to purify the body. 
salvation always comes from faith. Never from works. You can never impress God with your works, ever. It always comes by faith. Old Testament, New Testament. Now, Old Testament, by faith in the coming Messiah. In our dispensation, or post, you know, after the cross, we have faith in Christ that has died for us, that He came. So, it's faith, you know, forward, and now we're looking back, and we're believing in what Christ did for us. But it's faith altogether. We are always saved and justified by faith. All right. Salvation comes from God, not our will or exertions. Uh, Romans 9.16, So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Only God can save. You know, people have, some people have the idea that, well, I can really repent anytime. You know, I, I, and I've heard that. They'll, they'll tell me like, I'm oh, just going to, you know, have fun for now, live a little bit. And, and before I die, you know, I'll just need five minutes, whatever, ten minutes, you know, whatever it takes. And I'll repent and not so fast. It doesn't work that way. It's not the person that wills or somebody that tries really hard. It is the God, it's God that gives mercy. So, repentance and salvation come from God. Even to believe unto salvation comes from God. Faith has to come from God. The Word of God has to enter our heart to produce saving faith. A lot of people, not Christian people, have faith, but they're not saved. They're not saved. You have to have faith that comes from God, from the Word of God. It's the seed, that, the only seed that will produce salvation in our, in our lives. So it's very important. It is very important to understand that we don't, you know, like come and say, okay, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get saved. And a lot of people, and I've, I mean, I've, I see they, you know, they do the sinner's prayer, and, um, you know, and they would ask, you know, raise your hand if, if you want to receive Christ. But nobody can guarantee. Let's say 10 people, right, you know, lift up their hands, hands, and you can't tell them, you know what, now you guys are in heaven, praise the Lord, think, you know, great. You can't even say that. We, we don't know. I mean, we, we pray these prayers, but we don't know, because God saves. We are just praying, agreeing with people, we want people, you know, we're interceding uh, you know, for people. But salvation always comes from God. Even repentance comes from God. You cannot repent on your own. You think you can, but it, only when it comes from God, it produces that 180 churn. That, that, that is the power dynamic where God comes, that, that repentance, and, and then, you, and then there's, there's a fruit of that that we'll talk about. You know, what, is it, what does it look like? A person that is born again. So, so Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws them in, unless the Holy Spirit moves on their heart. So when we read in the book of Acts, uh, where the apostles would preach the gospel, you know, you can have a couple thousand listen, but, you know, not everybody believed. And it says that those believed those, who, be, those who, who, who believed that they were predestined. So God already so granted them repentance unto salvation. But a lot of people heard the message, but not all repented. Because repentance is a gift. It's a beautiful gift from God. So when it comes into our lives, you and God says, when I'm near, grab on to me. Grab on when I'm near. When I'm speaking to your heart, grab on. This is your chance. This is your chance. I am near to you. I am working with you. So repentance comes from God. We have to remember that. You cannot say, you know what, I'm going to come, I'm going to raise my hand, repeat the sinner's prayer, and everything's going to be fine. You don't know that. You do not know that. I prayed for people. And you know what? Interesting, and with Tatiana we ministered um, in, in Springfield, and one, um, she was a Russian girl from, from a church, from a conservative church, and went to church all her life. And she says, I have all these issues. And she's like naming up all the classic spiritual issues that pe people go through. I mean, very, very generic. But, but she says, I go to church. I, I don't know what's wrong. What, what, why is this happening to me? <clears throat> I pray. I feel nothing. And I, I don't know. I pray to this, this person, this person. Nothing's helping. And I, I ask her this one question. When, can you tell me the time when you met God? Like you could say, no, this is when God really met me. 
She says, I can't. I don't think I have. And all I said, I said, okay, let me tell you something. And I taught her the, the gospel that Jesus came from heaven to die for your sins. And I just, what I'm saying now about her human spirit coming from God, and God loved her so much that He sent Jesus to die in her place so she could be reunited with her father. The father longs for her. And she starts weeping. It's just weeping. And she just, and I can see she's being saved in, my, in front of my eyes. And the, the heart was standardized immediately. The tears came down. She received the gospel. person that went grew up in church. And I had to give her the gospel that she heard Many, many times. But it was different. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was moving on this. On the Word. And when she got born again, within a few minutes, the deliverance started taking place. Like it was immediately. The devil started coming out. Because she was born again and her spirit belonged to Jesus now. And it was easy work. Easy work. A lot of times, deliverance doesn't work out because people are not born again. They're just not saved. You, you pray for them and it's just like hitting a wall. You still minister because that's what we do. We ministers. Where people ask for prayer, we, we pray. But like I said, it's not the one who wills or exerts. It's God that gives mercy. Remember that. So when He gives you mercy, when you feel His presence in your heart, like you feel that in your spirit, like God. I mean, if that conviction comes. Grab onto it. Grab onto it and never let it go. Never let that go. It is. It is a beautiful thing. It is a gift of God. All right. Now. We can position ourselves to hear the Word of God and get convicted so we can repent. So there is a way. Let's say a person says, well, I, I, I don't feel God. In, and I hear that all the time. Like, I don't feel God. I, I try to read the Bible. I don't feel God. I try to do this. I don't feel God. What it tells me when somebody cannot connect to God at any level is they're not born again. Because when you're born again, you can hear His voice. You can hear His movement. You can't see Him. You know, and we know that scripture that that the spirit of God is is likened to a wind; it, it, it breathes wherever it wants, and we c we cannot see him, but we can hear his voice. You, all born again people can hear God's voice. So that tells me that the person is not born again. Well, and again, it's, if God shows mercy, and I can't give spiritual birth to him, it, you know, it's not our exertion. So, what is the recommendation? Is position yourself in places where there's the Word of God being preached. Come to prayer meetings. Uh, start coming to church meetings. Just, just show up. Show up, show up, show up, show up. There's a spiritual principle. When you knock, and knock, and knock, and knock, it will be open to you. Persistence. And there's a beautiful scripture that, that, that heaven, or the kingdom of heaven, it actually <laughs> loves... It, it uses you know, the, the New King James Version that it loves violence. And the violent take it by force. Meaning that we press in to the point where God responds. Like, you can do that. It's, it, it's in the Bible. Jesus says, if you're in a position and you want God to move in your heart, draw near to Him. Draw near to God. Draw near, find a place, a prayer meeting, just show up. And just, just show up and say, God, I'm here. Go to church, show up, say, God, I'm here. And if you do that consistently, trust me, He will not pass you by. He will touch your heart. And when that conviction comes, usually <clears throat> a repentance when it comes, it's very deep. There's, I believe there's tears. I believe there's this remorse of, of, of who we are and what we've done. I mean, it's not flipping. It's not like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm sorry. It, it, it's, it's really at the heart level. A true repentance always produces uh, a 180 in, in our lives. Always. I mean, we, we go one way, God meets us, and we start going the other way. That's what true repentance does to us. So let's talk about what is the evidence of our eternal salvation when we get born again. Evidence. So how do we see? Now we can't, obviously, with our own eyes, see spiritual things that happen in our, in our human spirit. We can't see them. Uh, but there are some things. So first is change of direction from darkness to light. That's the first thing that happens. Ephesians 5.8 says, For you were once darkness, so that's pre-saved, but now you are light, that's born again. In the Lord, walk as children of light. Now he's, what is he saying is, you were once darkness, so your spirit 
was separate from God, you walked in darkness. There was no light, there was no Holy Spirit living inside of you. But now when you turn to Jesus, now you are light. The Holy Spirit now lives in your human spirit. So there's light. Now it says, walk as children of light. So the change of direction. Now how does that happen practically speaking? So, so we get saved, we get born again. And so now the light of, of Jesus Christ enters our spirit. But the darkness is in our heart. Our emotions are dark. Our mind are just a stress in our head. It's like all these patterns, all these thoughts. All the things are going on, uh, the memories, everything is still there. Everything is, so there's darkness in our soulish realms, in our heart, and our minds. But the good news is there's the light of Jesus Christ in our spirit. So there's light and the separation with, within us, light from darkness. It's, light will always separate darkness. So now that we have the light, we have to have the light of Jesus Christ expand into the realm of our heart and soul. All right? That's where the problem is. It's at the heart level. Jesus said, oh, you know, all those things, they come out of your heart. Uh, take it, adultery, whatever. Uh, I don't worship, where? Heart, heart. It's always heart level. But now we're born again. Now the Holy Spirit is in us, helping us. So now the light needs to expand into our hearts. So how do we do that? Well, how we do that is we, we do... It's called spiritual disciplines. Now, the Bible is spiritual, all right? When we read our Bibles, when we read our Bibles, what do we do? The light of God starts to expand in the realm of our mind and heart. It's called the renewal of the mind. It's, it changes us. It, how you know, we thought one way, now we're thinking a different way. So it really produces change. And another spiritual uh, discipline is prayer. So it's Bible and prayer. Anybody that, pra after they get born again, practice those two uh, disciplines, they grow in light. The light that's in their spirit starts to expand into the areas of their heart. This is when lives change. Now, it's gradual. It takes time. But you can look back and you can see, I was, a month ago I was here, now I'm here. You know, another six months go by. You can really say, okay, okay I, 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 I really changed. No, things really, really changed. It always takes time. A lot of times people get born again and then uh, they have these negative emotions, they have these sinful uh, temptations, they have these demonic uh, roots still in there, uh, all these things still working in their life, you know. But they're saved. And, they're, and, and, so, and so they need what is called illumination of their heart. They need the light that's in their human spirit, the Holy Spirit, to expand into the realm of their heart and their mind. And how you do that, two things. Is the Bible, consistently reading the Word of God, and talking to God. Prayer is talking to God. If you break it down, prayer is when you talk to God. That's it. Those two things will have the light expand. And when the light expands, what happens, it, it always... Uh, points out the dark areas of our lives. For instance, let's just say that you are, are you just got saved. Off the street, got saved. And you, your light is very, very small. So you know, you understand. I got to read my Bible. I got to pray. I got to come to church. Um, that's, that's all you, that's, that's all you, you have. You know, maybe not use drugs, whatever. You, very basic, basic things, right? Now, as you, as you start reading your Bible, you start praying, Time goes by. The light that's in your spirit now is expanding. And then you start seeing things about yourself. They're like, man, that's messed up. Like, a week ago, you haven't even seen that. You just kind of you know, live in your life. Like, that's pretty normal. Uh, but now you're under, like, this is, feels wrong. I don't like it anymore. Like, what is happening? What is happening is the light is expanding and taking territory in your heart. It's liberating your heart. So, what happens? Your heart gets liberated. Now you can feel God a little bit more. You can feel His presence a little bit more. Still a lot of dark emotions, still a lot of, you know, depression, and whatever, things are happening. But you go deeper into God. You start talking to God. You say, Jesus, you know, thank you. Like, however your prayer life looks like. You know, and then the light expands even more. And that light will always cast out the darkness and then demons start showing up that live inside of you, that were kind of quiet, and were just kind of dormant, 
And they're like, man, I, I feel worse. And I tell people, you'll feel worse. Trust me. You're going to start praying and reading. You're not going to get better. You're going to get worse first. And that's actually good news. That means that the light is breaking up all of those layers. And they're coming to the surface because they're not comfortable anymore. They're being exposed by the light of Jesus Christ. And that's, uh, that's what that's the deliverance is. You, they come in and said, like, I wasn't fine. Now I'm not. I, I, I don't know what's happening to me. What's wrong with me? I'm like, we know what's wrong with you. Well, let's just pray. Okay. What, what are you going through? This and this. Okay, this is what, let's pray against that. Let's just, uh, you know, what's an open door? Did you do this? Yes, let's repent of that. That's an open door. Let's close that door. Let's cast out those roots. And, and so on and so forth. And then the person comes back again in a week. They feel great. They come back. And the next layer breaks loose. Like, man, what's happening? Now I have these thoughts I never had before. Like, they just, you know, I can't control them. Like, what's going on? Like, what type of thoughts? Ah, okay, that's the demon. All right. <laughs> let's close this door. Let's renounce this, you know, the spirit. Let's cast them out. Gone. Okay. And then, so, so that, that's how we become more liberate. Now, as, as they leave and, and devils unpack and, and our hearts, our own hearts become enlightened, we have the capacity of experiencing God in our inner man, like His pleasure, His just, just feeling really good inside, expands. Expands. The more free we got, the more we feel God. And that's how we grow in God. This is how we grow in the light. Again, we all start with very small light. We know very basic things, you know. And then let the light, just read your Bible, talk to God, and He will do the rest. He will change you from the inside. You don't have to exert yourself. Go deep into God. And He will liberate you. You know, some people, people try to, try to uh, fix the actual problem without going deep into God. And, and it, it, in your own strength, if somebody try that, I mean, it's, you know, it's just not going to work. But supernatural power, when that comes in into play, what happens is desire drops off. The demonic power that was you know, empowering that, that uh, activity is gone. So now your will has control over that area. How do demons work? They paralyze your will. In certain areas, that's how they do it. I mean, you're, you're you're fine in these areas, and then this one area you can overcome. Like why? Like you have strong will not to do like ten different bad things, but you suffer in this one maybe a little thing. Well, that means there is there is a power that is intensifying that desire that you cannot overcome. It's supernatural. It's demonic. You need to cast that out. Then your will will have. Then you have the willpower to say no. I don't want this anymore. I'm, I'm going this way. So this is, this is where the deliverance prayer you know, starts really taking, taking place. So again, it's the combination of two, two things. It's the reading of the Bible and talking to God. Let the light, this is how we grow in God. Only a born again believer can obviously experience that. You have to have Christ living in your spirit. Otherwise, it is impossible to do that. It's supernatural. We need God in, within us. All right. So change of direction from darkness to light, talked about that. So for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. That's all the things that are start appearing in our life. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. So that's the change that comes in inside. Then it says, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Now that's our part. We have to know things that our God likes, and we need to know things that God doesn't like. All right, We have to learn those things. So we do things that God likes, and we don't do things that God doesn't like. If you don't read your Bible, you will not know what God likes, and you will probably not know what God doesn't like if you don't read your own Bible with your own eyes. If you take your information from preachers, YouTube, all those other uh, channels, you'll have part truth, half truth, we have stuff mixed in. Put your own eyes into your own Bible and learn the things that God likes and things that He does not like. Simple. Just read it. Okay, God doesn't like that. Not doing it. Likes this. Do more of that. It comes upon us. We have to do that. Now, again, the supernatural part He does. But this thing we have to do. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Ah, fellowship. Agreements. Don't have agreements with darkness, with demons, with things that... You know, some, some sinful things we, we, we like and, and you know, we, we, we kind of repent of, of, of things we don't like, but there's some things we do like and uh, it becomes a point where like, uh, you, you know, there's this agreement with demons uh, because you're getting something out of that and, and there's this 
it's at the heart level. I mean, we don't, might not even kind of say that, but, but it's there. And so, so what Paul says, you have to break agreements with demons. Um, because, because if you don't do that, it's always going to be in the background. It's always going to be that one area that, that, that really can open doors for and then do a lot of the good things. So have no fellowship, have no agreements with demons at any level, at any time. Just say, you know what, I, don't, I, I just fight against this. I, I don't, you know, if it, even if it's attacking you, you, you just don't agree with it. How do we agree with things? It's easy. It says, well, you know, a like, good, good uh, example would be alcohol. You know, you know how people agree with alcohol? Well, it's in the Bible. Well, Jesus drank wine a little bit, you know, and then, you know, and then you have Timothy. He has stomach issues, and he had a little wine. Um, and then, you know, and, you know, and then they find some other places, and that's agreement. All right? How we don't agree is like, it's a problem. I have it. God help me. That's not agreement. That's breaking agreement. And God helps us. Got it? Simple. <laughs> I hope it's understandable. <laughs> So, so yeah, so the, anytime we start looking for Bible verses to say it's okay to do those things, agreement. When we say, I have an issue, I'm doing it, it's wrong, I don't know why I'm doing it, I need help, God, please set me free. No agreement. You're breaking those agreements and you will be free. It just takes time. God will help you with that. So, again, no agreement or uh, unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. That's exactly what it says, expose them. The fruit of the believer should always be righteousness. We always go for righteousness all the time. So that's the fruit we're seeking, is right living, is to live rightly. Well, at salvation our spirit is instantly sanctified and has righteousness of God, our soul and mind take time. So when we're born again, how does God look at us? Well, He looked always at us through our spirit man. Remember, God is a spirit. So what is born of the Spirit of Spirit? We come from Him, obviously. Our bodies come from, uh, from our parents. What is the born of flesh is flesh. We understand that. God always looks, us, looks at us through the Spirit. So when our spirit is born again, what He sees in our spirit is the righteousness of Christ. Why? Because He lives there. All right? Where are the issues? We talked about it's the heart, mind. So from that position, God is helping us to break free. If we, let's say, are born again, God looks at us as fully righteous, fully sanctified. Again, He's looking from our spirit. We look at ourselves on the other side from how we look and our character. We look on the opposite side. So we judge ourselves. Like, oh man, I'm, I'm, you know, and we call ourselves like names and we just put ourselves down. God looks from the spirit, from that point where we, are, we have the full righteousness of God. So when we step over the line, when we step out of the body... Let's say we just got born again, uh, like the thief on the cross, still, you know, like drug using, whatever, just, you just got saved, you know you're saved, you feel that, but you still have issues. If you step out of the body, God looks at you as you have never sinned. Why? Because of the righteousness of Christ. He looks at the Spirit. You leave the body, you are fully righteous. The problem is, is, our, is in the body, is our soul and unrenewed mind. That's the issue. And God is helping us to break free. Again, He looks at us through the Spirit as sons and daughters. You know, He loves us so much. He looks at us and he says good things about us. We look at ourselves, oh man, I'm such a screw up. He said, no, 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 don't, don't go there. God looks at you always from your human spirit. If you're born again, you are accepted, you are loved, you are perfect, you have the full righteousness of God. Now, He's helping you to deal with the other issues of the heart. Yes, He will help us, but He loves you as you have never sinned, but He is helping you to overcome all those things. Why? So you can experience God more. So you can walk with Him in fullness. Not just, you know, like, just struggling through, just to kind of hoping like He comes back soon because, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a blessed life. God wants to us blessed life. Yeah, get me out of here, yeah. <laughs> Why? Because of all that negative things that happen to us and, and all those experiences and, and we don't want to feel pain. And as soon as we step out of the body, that's all gone and we can understand that a little bit. So we want to go home. <laughs> we want to go home. God says, no, I have, you, there's a will I want you to do. There's, there's just all these dynamics. We can't just leave right away. I mean, we have to fulfill the will of God. But that's a different topic. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Uh, spiritual disciplines allow the light of God to expand in our heart, soul, and mind. Talked about that. 
Okay, difference between Old and New Covenants. Okay, that's the Old Testament and New Testament. What are the differences? Well, the covenant that was made between God and people was the Old co uh, Covenant. So when Moses led people of Israel out of Egypt, again, uh, he separated them, and then he made a covenant, agreement with them. He says, if you serve me, if you worship me, you will be blessed. In fact, no one will overcome you. I will give land as possession for you. You will inherit all those good things. But if you don't obey me, if you don't do what I, tell, what I say, if you, you know, don't obey commandments, all those things, the opposite will happen. The curse will come. The judgment will come. That's the agreement. And the people said, Amen. And Moses took blood of goats and bulls. He took hyssop. He, he took the blood and he sprinkled the blood on the Bible and on the people. He says, this is the covenant. You made an agreement between people and God. Now, here's the problem. God is always righteous. He can never lie. So, He can never break His part, right? The problem is us. They were unfaithful, I mean, immediately. I mean, Moses went up the mountain, saw God. They became unfaithful. And so they were the unfaithful ones. So the wrath of God or the judgments had to come. Had to come. And so in the, new, in the old uh, covenant, why people had to be stoned? Why was a penalty so harsh? Like somebody sinned, you read it in Leviticus. Just read Leviticus. Like how many people can you stone in a day? Like, I mean, you do this one thing, stone them. Do this one thing, stone them. Shall not live, shall die, should not live, shall die. Why? Well, because... God is holy, and the agreement is between people and God. God is faithful, we are not, we break our agree agreement with Him, and then just uh, we basically uh, receive what we agreed to will happen to us if we don't obey. So that's the, the, the old covenant, it was very difficult. And so, uh, in the new covenant, it's a little bit different, because now the new covenant is the agreement between Jesus and God. All right, Jesus came in the body as a Jewish man, as a son of David, and he made agreement with God. And guess what? Neither one can lie, neither one can break, they can never sin. So the agreement is eternal, sealed on his very own blood. I mean, it's just amazing. So, so what happens now? Jesus says, Well, now he says, I am the door. Now, agreement is between Jesus and God, so we get to enter through Him, through the door, through Christ, through the cross, into salvation. It's a door. We can enter, we can leave. Nobody gets stoned, nobody dies, right? We enter, we leave. People enter and leave all the time. We have to enter into the covenant through Christ to receive salvation. We can leave. It's a door. You can, leave, I mean, and that's why people leave the church, you know, or whatever, leave God, and nothing happens to them. I mean, I mean they will answer at the judgment. And Jesus says that I don't judge you. The words that I speak will, will do the will do the judgment, um, you know, in, in the final in the final day. So this is why people don't get stoned. You know, I feel like um, have a church service and somebody you know, is out of line. Okay, stone this guy. Doesn't happen. Why? Because the covenant is not with people and God is Christ and God, and we enter into the covenant through the door, through Christ, through the cross. That's how we get in, through the cross. Didn't do nothing, just believed. He said, God, have mercy on me. Jesus, I believe in you. You died for my sins, I repent. And you come in, and, he, and you'll find pasture. He says, you'll find pasture. You, I mean, there's going to be good things happening in your life. It's a free gift. In fact, the judgment comes not because... People per se sin. The judgment of God comes because they deny the free gift. They deny what Jesus has done for us. This is the greatest judgment is you deny the blood. I mean, you just, you just you know, take it for granted. That's the sin. That's the judgment. Because it's so freely given through Christ. So that's the differences. So the first covenant, people with God on the, on the blood of goats and bulls. Second covenant is God with Christ through His own blood and we enter in 
through the cross. That's the only way. All right. Uh, and uh, can we lose our salvation? That's uh, yeah. We can spiritually die if we deny Christ with our mouth. Let's read the scripture, Matthew ten thirty three. But whoever denies me before man, I will also deny him before my Father. So first way a person spiritually dies, where the Holy Spirit will live his will, will leave his, leave his spirit, is when with their mouth they deny Jesus. Say Jesus, you know the whole church thing, the whole God thing. I don't want it anymore. I don't believe it. Do 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 do. You die. You spiritually die. Second one, if we deny Jesus with our sinful lifestyle. Okay, so Titus 1.16 it says, They profess to know God. Not talks about people that are religious people. But in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. So, you don't have to deny Him with your mouth. Say, you know, Jesus, blah, blah, blah. you can actually do the, you know, all the works. You can uh, sing songs at church, you can do ministry, you can help the poor, uh, but you can persist in a sinful lifestyle. And by doing that, you are denying Him. And time comes when the Holy Spirit lives your spirit, and all you have is the form of godliness, but not His power. There is no more supernatural power. You have denied it. And you can read, but people, um, I mean, uh, Tim, uh, Paul writes to Timothy, you know, those people that have the form of godliness, that deny his power, look at the list up, what they do. A lot of people act like that, like, whoa, in the church, like, whew, yeah. What do they have? Form. What do they not have? The Holy Spirit. They're, not, they're, they're, they're dead. They're spiritually dead. So that's uh, how you do it. So you lose it by, deny, uh, you know, if you deny it with your mouth or with your works. Consistently, rebellion, rebellion, rebellion. And I always say to tell to people, be careful, there's only so much rope. You know, you, we will minister, they come back again, we'll pray, come back again, we'll pray, you know, come back again, we'll pray, but there comes a time, it seems like there's, there's, there's just, it's done. The person can't even come back. I mean, just like, it's over. They just disappear. It happens. It's very, very scary. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so we, we, <laughs> we have to understand those things, that we cannot persist in a sinful lifestyle and think we'll be okay at the end. It's deception. It's very dangerous deception, again, because you have the form. And the form, it, it deceives us in a way because we think it kind of... Um, we kind of think we have guarantees. You know, if I come to church, if I do this, if I feed the poor, if I do you know, a little ministry here, a little there, you kind of start feeling, well, that it's kind of, God will look at that and outweigh a little bit of, you know, things that I do and people maybe not really know what I do or maybe they do know. It doesn't work that way. If you do that, you will spiritually die. You'll, you'll do the form and everything you do at this point, it's actually to God means nothing. You're just wasting your time. Can you imagine a person that goes to church, that does the form, all the stuff, and then they end up going to hell? And they're thinking like, well, people in the world, you know, at least they have, they have like 30 years of whatever, and they know they're going to hell. Can you imagine a Christian person going through all the motions, all these, you know, Sundays that they go to church, and then end up in hell? Like, yeah. you know, it just makes no sense. Follow Jesus, and don't, don't get into it. You'll just waste your life. Yes, waste your life. So that's kind of the um, Bible says as far as uh, losing your salvation. Uh, you know, some people think, again, it's a religious mindset that you, you do one thing and then you, you have to get resaved again. No. It's consistent, sinful behavior. Consistent is the key. We all fall short in, in every area, many areas, especially when you're just starting out. Oh, my goodness. It takes, it, takes, it takes a while, it takes a year or two just to kind of get your life together and God helps you. But you're always making progress. You're always making progress. Your heart is always reaching for God. That's how you know. You're born again. People that are spiritually dead, they become very religious, very mean, very condescending. They put other people down. They're angry all the time. Why? They're spiritual dead. There's no love. There's nothing. They're just demons. And anyways, so... That's kind of what I had on my heart to share, to share a little bit. So um, to kind of uh, recap, just a quick recap that uh, 
Salvation is we are saved. We are saved from being separated from God. That's the salvation message. We are reunited with our Heavenly Father. We all come from Him. We are His offspring. God is the Father of spirits. Remember that. He is our Father, Abba. And He wants all of us to come home. That's why we do this. That's why we preach the gospel. Why? So all the children come home. He wants His children back. That's why we're ambassadors. We come, we plead with people, you know, reconcile with God. Please, just follow Jesus. And that's our, kind of our ministry. That's what we do. We're, we reconcile people to God. And, and, and so God wants His children to come home. And that's because He loves us so much. Again, motivation, love. That's it. He wants nothing from us but just love Him back. Even that takes God. You know, it takes God to love God. That's a different message, but it's, 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 uh, we'll, we'll end here. So let's close with prayer. Father, we're just so thankful. I thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit. Jesus, I thank you that you have poured out your Holy Spirit abundantly on us. What a beautiful gift you gave us from heaven, Jesus. Your precious Spirit. We love Him. We love you, God. Lord, I thank you. I ask that the Word of God that had been spoken that would be sealed by the power of your Holy Spirit, Father, in the name of Jesus, that we would grow in light, that you would enlighten your hearts, that we would receive power and anointing to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, to the glory of God. Amen and amen.